ready. I'll leave you the scene. Rock and roll. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks a lot, Sylvia. Uh, thanks also for giving me the opportunity to um, present at this BHF Centre Technology Workshop. Uh, I think it's going to be an excellent resource once um, we've collated uh, everyone's contribution. Um, so, yeah, hopefully this will be uh, a, a positive addition to that. So, uh, welcome everyone on the call. Uh, I'm going to be talking today about methods to image and understand immune cell behavior in inflammation. Um, essentially, I'm going to be talking about what's known as the parallel plate flow chamber. So this is basically mimicking a blood vessel in a dish, and I will go uh, into more details about its setup after I've given you a bit of a historical perspective and the importance of the use of the parallel plate flow chamber. Um, I'm then going to talk about things to consider before embarking on a parallel plate flow chamber experiment. And I think this is going to be important for those of you who are not familiar with the technique and who might be interested in uh, understanding how, you know, you might be able to implement this type of research in, in your work. Um, and then I'm going to give you an example of how we've used the parallel plate flow chamber to address um, unanswered questions in leukocyte recruitment. And this has really been uh, the bread and butter for um, a lot of our work in the past few years. And then I'll open the floor up uh, to questions. So as we all know, the, the migration of leukocytes uh, from blood vessels to sites of infection is absolutely vital to life. And really the, what the parallel plate flow chamber um, has, has achieved uh, is allowing us to understand what some of the molecular mechanisms are involved in driving uh, the emigration of leukocytes uh, from blood vessels and past the first biological barrier, which will be the endothelium. So the single cell uh, lining uh, of, of blood vessels. Now we've known for a very long time, uh, over 175 years ago, uh, through uh, the use of microscopes, um, that blood vessels actually interact with uh, vessel walls. Oh, sorry, leukocytes interact with uh, the walls of blood vessels. Um, and even uh, the depiction of uh, the extravasated leukocytes has been seen. So not only their accumulation, uh, at the blood vessel wall, but also their migration out into the surrounding tissue. And it's only really until the past 30 years that we've really understood what the molecular mechanisms are that drive these in, uh, increasingly adhesive interactions and their subsequent migration of leukocytes uh, from the blood into tissue. Now, what we know is that these cellular behaviors can be broken down in interdependent stages, uh, that being capture, rolling, slow rolling, arrest, adhesion, strengthening and spreading, intravascular crawling and transendothelial migration, which has now been shown to be either um, occurs between adjoining endothelial cells or through a single endothelial cell. This type of transcellular migration is believed to happen uh, under situations where the interendothelial junctions are so tight that it uh, forces leukocytes to kind of move uh, through this mode of migration, perhaps more than uh, than would otherwise seen, uh, otherwise be seen in uh, other tissues. So all of these interdependent steps have been shown to be regulated by different cell adhesion molecules and signaling proteins. And um, this has been done, it's been achieved mainly by the use of intravital microscopy, so live imaging and mainly in mice using genetic models, and also the parallel plate flow chamber. And in each of these cases, function blocking antibodies, say for example, to different cell adhesion molecules uh, have been used in order to see their impact on these various stages. And as I've said, because they are interdependent, each stage acts as its own checkpoint before um, the adhesion cascade can proceed to the next. 
So if you block, for example, integrins, uh, you will prevent the arrest of these leukocytes. And under the parallel plate flow chamber or intravital microscopy, what you'll see are leukocytes just rolling. OK, so it's the assignment of these various different um, cell adhesion molecules through the use of these function blocking antibodies or genetic knockout models have really ascribed uh, these uh, the contributions of these molecules to these stages. So this is just looking in a little bit more detail about some of the molecules involved and what we have here is a, a leukocyte interacting uh, with an endothelial cell on the top panel here. And then what we've got is a kind of magnified view of the plasma membrane of the leukocyte interfacing with the plasma membrane of the endothelium. And all of these various molecular interactions happening as uh, the leukocyte adhesion uh, cascade progresses from tethering towards arrest. What I want to highlight is the uh, involvement of the selectins. So L-selectins selectin be belong to a three-member family. L-selectin is found on the leukocyte and E and P-selectin are found expressed on the endothelium. And what they all do is interact with this sugar known as Salar Lewis X, which is an arrangement of four different um, uh, saccharides. Um, and so these are proteins that interact uh, with sugars and they deal with the very initial stages of tethering and rolling. Now, the parody of immune cells is that they are absolutely essential for fighting infection. And on the whole, they do it very well. But yeah, the paradox is that they also drive uh, the advancement of uh, various different diseases, uh, collectively kind of badged under the term sterile inflammation. And that's because there's no infectious agent actually driving these processes. Now, currently, we're using broad spectrum immunosuppressants such as methotrexate, for example, in, in sarcoidosis, rheumatoid arthritis and lupus, to dampen the progression of these diseases. But unfortunately, by the use of these immunosuppressants, we're immunocompromising individuals and therefore um, increasing prevalence of infection. So the paradox is how, how can we abate some of the involvement of uh, leukocytes in driving these diseases, but allow um, infectious processes to still ensue? And that I've just sort of re, uh, reiterated here in this important statement. And this is just um, drilling down the importance of um, uh, the parallel plate flow chamber. So along with, along with intravital microscopy, the parallel plate flow chamber has been a cornerstone technique in expanding our understanding of the molecular mechanisms that regulate leukocyte recruitment to sites of inflammation. And further understanding of mechanisms underpinning this process is likely to lead to the identification of novel targets to block unwanted leukocyte recruitment in sterile injury, but allow responses to life-threatening infections to ensue. And unlike intravital microscopy, the parallel plate flow chamber allows us to investigate human leukocyte recruitment. And this is a really important statement to make. Um, because as we start to search for novel targets, we want things that are going to be species specific, i.e. specific to humans. Um, this is the only uh, intravital microscopy uh, video footage I'll show you. And I think the, the, one of the only reasons why I'm showing you this is because the parallel plate flow chamber is, is uh, sometimes uses a, an ancillary technique to uh, intravital microscopy. But do remember, that the parallel plate flow chamber allows us to look at primary leukocytes interacting with primary endothelial cells. So this is, um, I'm fascinated by this video. Uh, it was um, uh, produced by Tim Lammerman when he was in Ron Germain's lab uh, at NIH back in 2013, where he took um, an albino mouse and uh, under anesthesia, basically, um, created a small pinprick to solicit the recruitment of uh, neutrophils and other leukocytes um, to uh, the 
extra vascular space. So these leukocytes had rec uh, been recruited from the circulation into the tissue. And then this slightly foggy green uh, signal here is basically where um, a laser light has been shone to create a localized area of necrosis. And what I want to, you to appreciate is, so this, is, this movie runs for an hour and it's speeded up to, to just a few seconds. But hopefully what you'll appreciate, this movie will loop as well, um, is the rapid recruitment of these neutrophils, which are in red. And then the slower kind of me meandering movement of these monocytes, which are in green, towards where the area of injury is. And we know that the interplay between neutrophils and uh, monocytes and macrophages is crucial to the uh, resolution of an inflammatory response. And sometimes it's the disordered organization of these leukocytes and their migration towards the affected tissue, which drives uh, uh, disease uh, in, a, in a way that we still don't know. And this goes back to trying to work out what those molecular mechanisms are. Uh, and we think that the parallel plate flow chamber can help us address some of that. So I want to give you an example of where uh, there's a difference between mice and humans in the way leukocytes are recruited to, um, to endothelial cells. Now we can see phenotypically down the microscope that they look exactly the same, but there are differences in their uh, molecular mechanism. And so what we know in, in human neutrophils is that the L-selectin present on the neutrophils is actually decorated with a sh the sugar it binds to, Salar Lewis X. And in, in this case, in humans, it's believed that L-selectin is the ligand to E-selectin because it's presenting its Salar Lewis X to E-selectin during these tethering and rolling phases. Now, given that the number of white blood cells, the, uh, the number of neutrophils um, within the white blood cell count constitutes about 50 to 70 percent, uh, this contrasts highly to the number of neutrophils that are present in mice. And as we go through the other immune cell subsets, for example, monocytes and lymphocytes, you can see that they are very, very different. So whilst we're able to you know, use intravital microscopy effectively to look at immune responses to injury, we should be very mindful of there being differences in molecular mechanisms, as well as the sort of the lesser heard issue of uh, the actual white blood cell count being very different between these two organisms. And really, again, I reiterate, that's why the parallel plate flow chamber is really important. So to my undergraduates, I show them this image, which is basically the, the setup of, of any typical parallel plate flow chamber. So our flow chamber uh, is, is placed in um, a heated chamber of uh, a microscope. Uh, so that's kept to body temperature. And what we have um, uh, uh, filling this chamber is a syringe pump, uh, which we can either put in withdrawal or refill mode, uh, depending on whether you want to push your cells from the syringe barrel or pull your cells through. Um, and uh, what we do is we create uh, a, a fixed flow rate so that the flow rate, at least for our studies, uh, would be anywhere between 1 to 2.5 dynes per centimetre squared. And this will mimic um, the, the shear stress that would be experienced in the microcirculation. Now, we use an equation to work out what the uh, shear stress is. And I'm not going to go into any detail over this other than to say you need to know the flow rate, the viscosity of the liquid that you're using uh, and the dimensions of your uh, flow chamber. Now, uh, nowadays, uh, we use a digital camera to view all of these interactions uh, and bespoke software to allow us to look at various different cellular behaviors um, uh, over the course of the experiment. So we're able to determine how many cells are in free flow, how many cells are tethering, rolling or adhering or crawling on the apical aspect of the endothelium or beneath the endothelium. Um, and then also uh, to monitor the directionality of their movement. So if you walk into the third floor uh, microscope room at the James Black Center, this is what you'll find. This is the, the um, 
microscope that we've been using for many years now uh, for our parallel plate flow chamber experiments. So this is an inverted microscope where the objective lens is facing uh, upwards um, rather than pointing downwards in a, a probably a classic microscope configuration that you'd be more familiar with. Um, and we very rarely nowadays use these eyepieces, and that's because, as I mentioned before, uh, there's a digital camera that's that's rigged up to uh, the, the microscope. And so all of the visualization really happens using uh, a monitor uh, that's interfaced with that digital camera. The syringe pump I've already mentioned to you is where we actually, uh, our cells would be contained here and through tubing, we would pass through our cells uh, that will then eventually enter the barrel of the syringe. So our syringe pump will be in withdrawal mode, pulling cells from a reservoir through the flow chamber and then out uh, into the waste. Um, we have a vacuum pump and I'll explain to you why we use that. Uh, and there are various microscope controllers which will um, be controlling the shutter um, speed uh, depending on the, uh, uh, the acquisition times. Uh, and also we would be acquiring images from different areas of the flow chamber as well. So we'll be um, setting the stage uh, to kind of go through various uh, different uh, uh, coordinates uh, in order to uh, image, uh, you know, different areas of the, the flow chamber in parallel. So there are many, many different types of flow chambers that you can, you can either make yourself or buy on the market. Uh, the ones that I've been using for many years now is uh, produced by Glycotech. So it's made up, uh, first of all, I should mention it's only 35 uh, millimeters in diameter. So it's not a very big flow chamber um, and it's made up of three parts. So there's this perspex manifold into which we can deliver cells and that they can leave. Uh, there's also this um, outer tubing, uh, which is aligned with some perforations around the edge here uh, of this gasket, um, which basically draws air through and allows uh, a tight seal to form between this glass cover slip and the gasket. So the gasket really defines the boundary of the um, and, and the dimensions of uh, the flow chamber. And the glass cover slip we use um, uh, to grow our endothelial cells. And, and the classic ones we would use are human umbilical vein endothelial cells. Um, and these are extremely thin, uh, the, the, the gasket and the, uh, the glass cover slip. So you have to be very careful in how you handle uh, uh, the, the cover slip. I can go into more detail in questions uh, about that if you're interested. So this is just a schematic showing you uh, how we deliver our cells. So the, the cells are, are delivered in a unidirectional manner through flow. Um, and then we switch on a vacuum pump, which will be pulling air through these perforations. OK, so once the entire thing is assembled, uh, this negative pressure will be sealing uh, the glass cover slip onto the silicone gasket and the perspex manifold. Um, and this is just another view of it, which I use to show my uh, undergraduate students in uh, a, a workshop that I host there. So the glass cover slip, we would typically coat uh, in 10 micrograms per mil of fibronectin. We would then allow our HUVEC to seed our human umbilical vein endothelial cells. And once they formed a monolayer, we would then stimulate them with an appropriate cytokine, such as TNF-alpha or IL-1-beta. And we would allow that stimulation to proceed for either six hours, which would be probably the minimum time required for NF-kappa-B mediated responses uh, to, to be basically be effective. So for cell adhesion molecules to be produced uh, and expressed at the, at the apical aspect of the of the endothelium, as well as the production of chemokines as well. Uh, and the other time point we would typically use is 20 hours following stimulation. So either sort of by the end of the day, you would be performing a flow assay or the, the following day if you stimulate the night before. And, you know, this is a similar thing where this is our green silicone gasket, the perspex manifold and our glass cover slip. If you flick the um, uh, the, the vacuum line on, you're drawing um, 
negative air pressure so you can um, stick this down onto the glass cover slip. Obviously, you're killing the endothelial cells wherever the uh, silicone gasket is, but it really doesn't matter because what you're interested in is the preservation of these live cells, which you will then fill with media. Um, and this will now create an, a watertight environment uh, where you can then perfuse through your leukocytes. And as I mentioned, also, uh, these interactions are observed using an inverted microscope lens. So that's the lens sort of pointing upwards. Um, so this video is typically what we would see down the microscope. The field of view that we have here is about 1,500 microns by 1,200 microns. Um, and we perfuse neutrophils here at a density of 1 million cells per mil. And this is really important uh, to, to consider. It's important to consider cell density because you don't want too many cells uh, impacting your your um, field of view. Otherwise, it's going to be really difficult to analyze um, and understand what's going on in terms of cellular behavior. So in this flow assay, uh, what we can see very nicely are various phases of the multi-step adhesion cascade. You can see there's cells crawling on top of the endothelium. There are cells uh, undergoing uh, tethering and rolling and slow rolling and firm adhesion. All of these steps can be visualized in a single video footage. Um, and they're very easily scorable as well. Um, <clears throat> what's probably the easiest to score is this phase bright, phase dark um, uh, um, contrast between what's on top of the endothelium and what's underneath the endothelium. So you can see very nicely here, uh, all of the cells that are above are phase bright. And as soon as they enter, uh, the subendothelial space, they change uh, their phase contrast quality. So in addition to imaging these cells alive and then uh, uh, capturing all of these events, what you can do afterwards is separate away that glass cover slip from the gasket and the perspex manifold and then fix in 4% PFA. You can then permeabilize your sample and subject it to various stains and dyes with antibodies. And what we've been very interested in understanding is uh, this process here of trans endothelial migration. Um, because as you'll see from this image uh, taken from the KEG pathway, so if you, if you go into KEG and you type in leukocyte trans endothelial migration, it'll give you a lot of pathways that are involved in how leukocytes adhere to the endothelium. But there's actually very little mechanistic insight into uh, this process of trans endothelial migration. You can see there are only a few molecules here, such as PCAM1, CD99, and the integrins being involved in mediating this process. So we're super interested in kind of um, working out uh, what's going on in this, uh, this process here. And I'll talk about that uh, later on. But suffice to say, uh, you know, if you take away this glass cover slip from the flow chamber and subject it to various stains and dyes, so uh, for example, uh, phalloidin, which will light up the actin cytoskeleton, and then use various antibodies to your proteins of interest, you can then take that to a much higher powered microscope um, and look, say, for example, with a, a confocal microscope and look at very different optical sections as you run through the apical aspect of the endothelium down to the basolateral aspect of the endothelium. And so this is showing you really a group of leukocytes that have adhered to the endothelium. You can only see the endothelium if you stain for PCAM here. Uh, the actin cytoskeleton here is showing you some of the stress fibers that are present in these endothelial cells. And then the, uh, the actin cytoskeleton of the leukocytes can also be visualized in, in the top uh, and the base. Um, and you can see here, I've just taken where these uh, hatched insets are. Um, I've taken a much more sort of amplified view of what's going on. And you can really start to look at uh, the subcellular organization of some of these molecules in very different areas of the cell. And that's, uh, that's become an extremely important way for us to understand how these molecular interactions are occurring in different areas of the same cell undergoing a single 
um, cellular process. So, um, as I mentioned before, the parallel plate flow chamber really only goes as far as describing what happens when leukocytes adhere and when they undergo transmigration. The other really important part is how they keen attacks towards um, a site of injury. So after emigrating, a leukocyte will um, adopt, although it's not really shown here, it will adopt polarity. So it will have a front and a back and the leading edge will uh, be we, um, taking the leukocyte to where uh, this area of uh, injury or infection is. And that's by vir virtue of various uh, chemoattractants such as chemokines and um, um, formile peptides, et cetera, uh, that the, the neutrophil in this case will have receptors for. Um, so what we've done in order to sort of uh, maybe investigate more the chemotaxis in our parallel plate flow chamber is to actually um, uh, elaborate on the, the simpler parallel plate flow chamber model uh, using, and this was in collaboration with Guillaume Charas, who's based at the London Centre for Nanotechnology at UCL, and uh, was a project of uh, Jess Davis, a PhD student uh, in my lab. And here what we've done is we've used polydimethyl siloxane or PDMS, which is a, a, a very viscous uh, resin which you can pour onto on top of a glass cover slip um, and create a trough uh, into which you can then embed collagen. And here we've used rat tail collagen. Uh, which can, is liquid uh, in the cold and it can polymerize um, if you put it at 37 degrees uh, into collagen fibrils. Uh, and on top of that, once that's set, then we can um, uh, grow an endothelial monolayer on top of this. But PDMS, um, I'm really understating its use here, can also be microfabricated. So we can produce microchannels into uh, this region here. Um, and uh, we're able to also perfuse in chemoattractants so that they can enter from the underside of this collagen plug and create a gradient towards the endothelium so that when we perfuse our leukocytes, uh, they not only adhere and transmigrate, but they start migrating through this three-dimensional scaffold to where uh, the chemoattractant, in this case, we've been using IL-8 or uh, FMLP, the formal peptide, where they migrate to where the concentration is highest. Now, the problem with using this approach, whilst it's, you know, taking us a step closer to building a blood vessel in a dish, um, the collagen doesn't really polymerize uh, in equal ways from one experiment to another. So what's important is in this uh, type of experiment is to have your reference cell. So we we in our experiments we've got two different cell lines. Uh, you don't really need to know what they are, but the reference cell line is going to be there in order to compare any migratory differences between these two experimental cell lines. And what we can do in this case is label them with different fluorescent trackers. Okay, so you can buy a cell tracker blue uh, that's coloured blue, green, and red. And that will enable you to co-perfuse all of these cells and, and look at the migratory differences between your cells of interest against the, um, uh, against the reference cell. And this really overcomes the issue of uh, the, the rat tail collagen polymerizing very differently from one prep to the next. So if we um, take that, um, if we take this prep, run it for about four hours and then we fix it uh, and then um, we take it to uh, we can image it you know stain up the um, sample with phalloidin for example and, and other um, uh, uh, antibodies against different uh, target proteins what we can do is uh, take optical sections all the way through the specimen and then reconstruct that into a three-dimensional image and so what you can see here are these green blobs, which are our cell lines, actually, and they've migrated through and they're suspended in the collagen matrix. And they're making their way towards where this uh, chemoattractant gradient is. 
So this is a really useful way now where we've developed our parallel plate flow chamber, not only to support adhesion and transmigration, but chemotaxis as well. So in, in addition to, um, you know, making the, the parallel plate flow chamber more complex, we can also strip it down uh, to the bare essentials. And in this case, we can simply just immobilize cell adhesion molecules such as the selectins. We can co-immobilize those selectins with chemokines and uh, with immunoglobulin superfamily members, for example, ICAM-1 or VCAM-1. And we can start to reconstitute the adhesion cascade on a glass cover slip. So this will depend on, you know, the immobilization conditions. This all needs optimizing, of course, and things to take into account are the concentrations of, of how you're going to immobilize these proteins, um, the time that it will take, uh, and the temperature. Are you going to do this at 37 or 4 degrees Celsius? Um, and also the perfusion conditions in terms of cellular density, as I mentioned before, if you have too many cells uh, interacting with your, your um, your glass cover slip is going to be very difficult to quantify. So this is just showing you an example of where we've immobilized Salar Lewis X, that tetrasaccharide that uh, is the sugar that binds to L-selectin and mediates uh, rolling. So these cells are bearing L-selectin and we've immobilized, immobilized its ligand Salar Lewis X. And you can see that these cells are rolling. The kind of faster moving comets are uh, cells that are out of view. So in addition to uh, imaging immune cells to understand uh, uh, the mechanisms that regulate homing of, of, of leukocytes to sites of inflammation, we can also use the parallel plate flow chamber to look at stem cells uh, and try to understand the molecular mechanisms that uh, guide their traffic towards sites of injury. So you can imagine there's a number of ways we can use stem cells. You can take bone marrow aspirates, for example, and um, uh, use that in your perfusion studies. Uh, we've collaborated with a number of individuals looking at cancer cells and how they, uh, how the parallel plate flow chamber can help answer uh, mechanisms of metastasis. So this is where, you know, uh, primary uh, tumor cell, sorry, tumor cells uh, migrate from a primary site and metastasize to distant organs. And we can also look at how blood-borne cancers interact with endothelial cells. So there's clearly other ways uh, of using the parallel plate flow chamber other than what it was uh, originally um, designed to do, which was to investigate the interaction of immune cells with um, uh, endothelial cells. So this slide is uh, quite busy. I'm going to spend a while going over it uh, because this is the bit that might interest you the most in the sense that, you know, uh, if you are considering uh, using the parallel plate flow chamber, um, you, you will need to consider um, uh, these these following kind of uh, issues and options. So the first one would be, what is the purpose of your experiment? Are you wanting what I call icing on the cake data? That would be to complement some in vivo data that you have. So if you've got some uh, you know outcome that involves immune cells and possibly uh, involves their recruitment, then looking at the parallel plate flow chamber as a way to address your um, answer might be a really uh, useful way. So this we've done um, uh, with a number of collaborators. And I uh, mentioned also before about uh, individuals interested in cancer metastasis. So they really uh, needed us to, to finish off some data for them uh, because what they had identified was um, a tumor suppressor, an in vivo tumor suppressor, uh, which they believed impacted the way cancer cells interacted with um, endothelial cells. And so we were able to provide that icing on the cake data for them. Uh, the other one could be an exploratory screen. And uh, I will go into that in a bit more detail as we proceed down this slide. So the other thing you want to, want to consider is the sort of cell type that you're interested in. So there's uh, a number of endothelial cells that are on the market, be they uh, from the venous uh, side or the arterial side, and also uh, endothelial cells from the microcirculation, um, like uh, dermal, 
uh, microvascular endothelial cells. Uh, I've also mentioned that we use human umbilical vein endothelial cells. And in my honest opinion, I think they act as a very good gold standard uh, for uh, our work, at least. Uh, then there's the leukocyte. So uh, fortunately, um, uh, uh, today we have a number of companies providing cell isolation kits. So you can uh, bleed healthy volunteers or if you're involved in a clinical trial, patients uh, use these various kits to isolate different immune cell subsets. So we've uh, in our lab, we've isolated uh, neutrophils and monocytes. Uh, in particular CD14 or inflammatory monocytes. Um, but there are kits uh, out there that can um, uh, that will provide the isolation of, of other immune cells. And you can either use positive or negative isolation kits. I prefer to use the negative ones. This is where basically um, antibodies and magnetic beads will bind to the cells that you don't want leaving the cells that you do want untouched as they sieve through a kind of um, uh, a column. Uh, you know, you could be interested in uh, a type of cancer cell. Uh, I've done, as I said, work on this before. So cancer cells are really interesting in that if you want to observe them being perfused under flow, some cancer cells prefer to aggregate so uh, there have been in, in previous uh, collaborations issues with um, cellu cellular aggregation. So you might be growing a cancer cell line in a dish. Uh, and then when you harvested it, so you may have digested it off the dish, um, resuspended it as a single cell suspension and then perfused it into your flow chamber. By the time those cells reach your flow chamber, you'll see that they aggregate into massive lumps. So there are some you know, situations that you have to um, be careful of how your cells might behave uh, when suspended in, in uh, a perfusion media. Uh, stem cells, I've mentioned before, maybe taking something like bone marrow aspirates could be quite interesting to, to use. Um, and then you need to also consider your treatment and control groups. So if you're using a synthetic compound, you want to ask yourself, do I want to inhibit my endothelial cells? Do I want to inhibit my leukocytes or, you know, other cell types? Or do I want to inhibit both to understand a particular mechanism? So the issue about inhibiting one cell line over the other is that that's going to work very easily if you've got an irreversible inhibitor, because basically you can pre-incubate that irreversible inhibitor with either the endothelial cell or the leukocyte. Or, or cancer cell or stem cell before you actually conduct the, um, the perfusion assay. And it will really very much depend on um, how long the irreversible inhibitor acts for as well. So uh, you can use uh, siRNA. You could also use barcoded shRNA libraries, for example. So you could infect a whole load of immune cells with a library that's barcoded perfuse those cells. And if you're interested in the ones that are either sticking to the apical aspect of the endothelium and not transmigrating, or the ones that are transmigrating but not migrating once under the endothelium, you might be able to select these out and enrich for um, the cells that are, are, are behaving in the way that you observe. And then based on their barcode, identify what gene has been targeted. And then obviously microRNAs are very popular nowadays. So those uh, could be um, used in a, a treatment group. Again, are you going to be subjecting your leukocytes or endothelial cells to these? There are cell isolation methods that you can use uh, for, for maybe knockout or knock-in mice. Uh, so you can isolate pulmonary microvascular endothelial cells, grow them on the glass cover slip and perfuse over uh, maybe bone marrow cells, which are predominantly neutrophils. Uh, and then the perfusion conditions. So, you know, if you're interested in how immune cells behave in hypoxia, you may need to add DMOG to uh, mimic hypoxia in the perfusate, or uh, which might be a more complicated uh, uh, venture is to um, place everything, including the microscope in a hypoxic chamber. Uh, I mentioned before that we uh, apply a shear stress of anywhere between 1 to 2.5 dynes per centimetre squared. 
uh, and that mimics uh, uh, shear stress in the microcirculation. But obviously, you'll need to increase that if you're interested in understanding how leukocytes adhere to uh, maybe um, aortic or coronary uh, endothelial cells. Uh, and also, you may need to precondition your endothelial cells. So it's already known that atherosclerosis, for example, uh, is predisposed in areas uh, of oscillatory shear stress rather than laminar shear stress. Uh, and if you're interested in either of these two aspects, you may need to subject your endothelial cells for a period of time before you actually conduct the flow assay. And Richard Xiao will have uh, an instrument that could um, precondition endothelial cells um, uh, under um, under this uh, uh, under these conditions before um, perfusing. And then also things to consider are uh, how long are you going to perfuse your cells for? Is it going to be minutes, hours, days? Uh, the longer the period of time, the more you need to consider about sterility issues. So, for example, our ones won't go for more than 20 minutes. So we try to keep our sterility issues down to the level of maybe, um, you know, uh, sterilizing with 70% uh, uh, ethanol. Um, and that seems to be good enough. And, you know, we are resuspending our cells, our immune cells, after we've isolated them. That All of that is done on the bench. So we're not really that worried about um, sterility issues. But obviously, these are things that are going to have to be taken into account if you're moving into uh, the realms of hours or days. And then the scale of your experiment, you know, what are you doing? Uh, is it just imaging? In which case you probably won't need uh, that much of a, uh, you know, an area to sample. And therefore, um, you know, the scale of your experiment can be quite small. What might be limiting is, uh, for example, if you're using stem cells, you really need to scale down your, um, first of all, the dead volume of all of the tubing that leads to and uh, uh, from the reservoir of your stem cells to where the flow chamber is. So you want to keep that dead volume as low as possible if these cells are really limiting. Um, but also, uh, you know, if it's not imaging and, and you want to move into proteomics and RNA-seq, then I think you really need to consider how abundant uh, do you want your it's not how abundant, sorry, how much material are you providing for a proteomic screen? Um, and so you might need to scale that up. Um, and similarly for RNA-seq. Um, and then in terms of screening, uh, again, I mean, that that's kind of open, but I suppose I put this up just in order to not exclude it, because I think understanding the scale of your experiment, depending on, on what it is you want to do, is, is, is an important consideration. Um, and what sort of platform of flow chamber? So they can be like the one that I, I mentioned, 35 millimeter diameter flow chamber. There's also these microfluidic, a quasi high throughput, I call platforms, which to be honest, I don't think are great because once you start moving into microfluidics, whilst, whilst they do represent um, you know, dimensions of a blood vessel, they are extremely difficult to use. Uh, you know, to seed in your endothelial cells. So I would tread with caution with using this type of approach, but they are available commercially. Okay, so um, now that we've kind of moved away from uh, considerations, I want to uh, go into how we've used the parallel plate flow chamber to address unanswered questions in leukocyte recruitment. And I've already mentioned to you how understudied this area is of how leukocytes pass between adjoining endothelial cells. And that uh, was something that really piqued my interest, particularly uh, in, in the cell adhesion molecule that I'm interested in, L-selectin. So in most um, uh, textbooks, what you'll see is that L-selectin is intact on the surface of leukocytes such as neutrophils and that it's proteolytically cleaved once these leukocytes undergo firm adhesion. And actually what we found uh, back in 2015 and subsequently worked up uh, using the parallel plate flow chamber is in, in fact that L-selectin is not cleaved at this stage 
it's cleaved at the stage of diapodesis or trans endothelial migration, which in some of my slides you'll see is um, written as TEM or T-E-M. So um, we came across this because uh, we used an antibody, a non-function and non-function blocking antibody uh, called LAM114, which is a kind gift from Tom Tedder, which we conjugated to an Alexa floor dye um, and labeled up these inflammatory primary human monocytes uh, and perfused those antibody labeled cells over TNF activated endothelial monolayers. So like in the image before, what you'll see are phase bright cells binding. And then as they undergo trans endothelial migration between these endothelial junctions, as you can see, um, they appear phase dark. Um, what you can see here on the right panel is that antibody uh, labeled. Uh, so, so basically on the left, we have the phase contrast image and on the right, we have the fluorescence channel showing where the antibody is at any given time on this uh, on, on the cells. And um, hopefully what, uh, what I hope you can see is that um, as these leukocytes are binding and undergoing trans endothelial migration, that red signal is being lost, which would suggest that L-selected shedding is happening actively during trans endothelial migration, but not like in this cell, which is adhering on the top of the endothelium and not really moving anywhere. So this is just taking a time sequence uh, showing that as uh, these cells go from phase bright to phase dark, you can see that the L-selectin signal in red is lost over time. But we've been using epifluorescence microscopy here to image that loss of um, loss of L-selectin. And the resolution isn't that great. So what we had to do was use uh, confocal microscopy and take apart that um, parallel plate flow chamber as I described before um, and subject it to PFA fixation and labeling. Basically what you've got here are two cells, one that is just adherent on, on the apical aspect of the endothelium and one that is actively go, uh, undergoing trans endothelial migration. And what we've taken are optical sections from the top of the endothelium running through to the middle and to the base of the endothelium where it contacts uh, the cover slip, the glass cover slip. And what you can see is that this transmigrating uh, monocyte has ex it still has its L-selectin intact, uh, which is uh, present here. So uh, this is showing you that bona fide trans endothelial migration is happening because this is VE cadherin, this is a junctional stain. And when immune cells cross endothelials through this trans, sorry, the paracellular transmigration route, they need to break these junctions. And so in the merge image, you can see where the VE cadherin signal has been breached and that the pseudopod, the leading edge of the cell, is L-selectin positive. I should mention that the antibody that's recognizing this L-selectin is recognizing it above the cut site. So if it's binding to L-selectin, it's binding to intact L-selectin. So um, by combining uh, live cell imaging and something like um, uh, 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 confocal microscopy, we can gain a much better understanding of what's going on. Uh, we've also used um, these THP1 cells. Now, these do not go phase dark at all. You can see over this uh, perfusion experiment, there's very few. There's, in fact, just one cell down here that undergoes full trans endothelial migration. And these cells we've got to express L-selectin. They, they, they don't normally express L-selectin. So we used um, uh, lentivirus to uh, get them to express L-selectin as a GFP tagged protein. And what you can see uh, uh, that you couldn't see before is that whilst these cells are stuck, you can see that they're protruding their leading edges underneath the endothelium. And what we've managed to do is get these cells to express um, fluorescent, uh, differently fluorescently tagged forms of L-selectin to ask the question where we've seen L-selectin present in um, these protruding pseudopods, if it's present, what is it doing? 
is it being clustered? So uh, we use GFP and RFP tagged forms of, of L-Select in here uh, to ask that question. And with the help of Maddie Parsons, indeed, we were able to show that the part of the, the, the protruding pseudopod um, was clustering its L-selectin, whereas the non-transmigrated uh, uh, region of the cell, the L-selectin wasn't uh, protruding. And what we know now um, is that this uh, uh, clustering is providing a signal to drive pseudopod protrusion and uh, transmigration across the endothelial monolayer. So what the parallel plate flow chamber has allowed us to do is to redefine this multi-step adhesion cascade and not ascribe L-selectin to just being involved in tethering and rolling, but actually it's actively involved in regulating trans endothelial migration, uh, which is uh, this uh, uh, last part of the multi-step adhesion cascade. Uh, and as I've mentioned before, you can read up on these if you want. We've uh, undergone various different uh, uh, experimental approaches to understand what interacts with L-selectin during these stages of transmigration. Uh, the post-translational modification of the cytoplasmic tail um, and very recently how L-selectin co-clusters in cis with uh, a cell adhesion molecule that's known to be involved in trans endothelial migration. And looking at the time to say that the parallel plate flow chamber has acted as a major technique in facilitating our understanding of human leukocyte trafficking to of, of how human leukocytes traffic to sites of injury and infection. Um, it was originally designed to investigate interactions between primary human leukocytes and endothelial cells of different origins. However, the technique can be used to model many other biological scenarios, for example, stem cell trafficking and cancer cell metastasis. Um, this technique is complementary to intravital microscopy, but some processes remain species specific, as I've shown. And this is important to understand with respect to identifying novel and meaningful therapeutic targets and drug design. And finally, adapting the parallel plate flow chamber can bring uh, models closer to in vivo situations, for example, as in the collagen uh, model. However, that requires uh, optimization, which I didn't really go into, but that's open for questions. Okay, thanks, Sylvia. Thanks, Alex.